Thank you for joining us today for another AMA Advocacy Insights webinar. I'm Jesse Ehrenfeld, president of the American Medical Association, and I'm so delighted to serve as your host today. Our Advocacy Insight webinars, they're really designed to keep physicians informed about important issues that are affecting them and their patients. Today, we're going to talk about legislative, regulatory, and other advocacy efforts to support telehealth, in particular, issues around state licensure. We're going to do that with a panel of experts who are going to help us understand the current landscape of state licensure for telehealth and what's ahead. Now, as we all kind of learned during the pandemic, telehealth is an essential part of medical practice today. It can be a lifeline for patients, particularly those with limited mobility, those in rural, economically or socially marginalized communities, and those who are managing a chronic illness. That's why even though the pandemic's behind us, the AMA continues to champion telehealth expansion as a part of our recovery plan for America's physicians that we launched just last year. One of the primary factors fueling telehealth expansion during COVID-19 was the easing of the many restrictions that had previously applied to virtual care. If you think back prior to March of 2020, Medicare only reimbursed a limited number of telehealth services and it did so only for patients who resided in rural areas and who had traveled to a medical facility to receive them. The AMA, we led the fight to lift those and other limitations so that patients nationwide could access telehealth services and get them in their own homes. A subsequent survey showed that 85% of responding physicians now embrace telehealth services. When the COVID-19 public health emergency ended in May, Ensuring that new policies enabling telehealth expansion would remain in place became an AMA priority. Our advocacy helped secure passage of federal legislation that's extended these pandemic-related telehealth flexibilities through 2024. And we are enthusiastic supporters of the Connect for Health Act of 2023. This is a bipartisan proposal now pending in Congress that would further expand Medicare coverage of telehealth services while making pandemic-related flexibilities permanent. And because the role of telehealth in the U.S. healthcare delivery is likely to gain even more prominence going forward, we are working at the AMA to ensure that physicians have all the tools, the resources, and the support that they need to more seamlessly integrate telehealth into their workflows. And we're working to make sure that patients have access to those physicians. Now, we'll talk about that and a lot more today with our panel of experts. I want to make sure we have enough time to discuss these important issues and answer your questions. So let's go ahead and dive in. I am so delighted to introduce an incredible panel of today's leading experts, and I'll ask them to join me now on screen. First, we've got Clark Barinow, who is an Assistant Vice President of Government Affairs at the Medical Society of Virginia, where he directs their advocacy efforts as Chief Lobbyist. Clark is a leading public affairs professional with a proven track record of results in government relations, social media advertising, regulatory affairs, crisis communications, and organizational strategy. Welcome, Clark. Next is Marshall Smith, Executive Director of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which provides an expedited process for physicians to become licensed in multiple states. With more than 20 years of government management experience, Marshall brings a wealth of insight medical health licensing laws and regulations. The compact has been a leader in helping physicians obtain licensure in multiple states. And he's gonna share some insights from their work with us today. Welcome, Marshall. Next, I've got Dr. Sarvam Takanda, a plastic surgeon at the Mayo Clinic and the immediate past chair of the Federation of State Medical Boards. His medical expertise includes published research on virtual care and telemedicine, including an article Payment and Coverage Parity for Virtual Care and In-Person Care, How Do We Get There? Welcome, Sarva. We also have Jared Augenstein, Managing Director at Manat Health Strategies, where he works with healthcare providers on strategy, digital health, telehealth, and delivery system transformation. Jared has a lot of experience helping large health systems, academic medical centers, and children's hospitals with strategic planning, transformation, and population health infrastructure development. Welcome, Jared. And finally, we've got Kimberly Horvath, a senior attorney at the AMA, where she provides legal oversight for our legislative and advocacy goals at the state level. Kimberly has over 15 years of experience in healthcare advocacy and is a valued leader 
in helping us advance the mission of our organization. Welcome, Kim. I'm now going to turn things over to Kim and Jared, who will be presenting some materials before we move into the panel discussion. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ehrenfeld. It's uh, great to be with the AMA and this esteemed uh, panel today. We're looking forward to, to the discussion. So uh, are the slides available? I don't see them. There we go. Great. Thank you. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, fantastic. So as, as Dr. Ehrenfeld mentioned, uh, uh, Kim and I are going to provide a, a bit of an overview of the state of play in telehealth licensure. Uh, Kim's going to provide a deep dive on specific state approaches, and then we're going to get into a, a panel discussion for, for most of the time today. Next slide. Great. So I thought I would start by just providing a little bit of historical context on how we got where we are today related to state licensure and in particular state licensure in the, in the context of the world in which we're living and where, where an increasing number of services are being delivered via telehealth. Um, I think it's important to note that going all the way back to 1791, the Bill of Rights granted states the right to regulate health. Now, you know, since that time, there's been a huge variability uh, that's emerged in terms of the size, structure, and authority of medical boards. Some are independent, other medical boards are integrated into larger state agencies like state departments of health, and most medical boards combine uh, of representation from physicians and also members of the public. Now, fast forwarding you know, a couple hundred years uh, to 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic, to meet the increased demand for care, and in many cases, supply and demand imbalances uh, that existed across the country. You'll remember during the first few waves of COVID, there might be significant spikes in certain parts of the country where there were lulls in other parts of the country. So for a while, we were really trying to manage this huge mismatch in supply and demand across the country. And in light of that, um, many states, all states in fact, uh, provided some sort of flexibility related to licensure. Uh, in many states, licensure requirements, components of licensure requirement were, were waived. Uh, in many states, there were broad reciprocity waivers that were implemented, which essentially permitted physicians and other healthcare professionals with an active license in good standing in one state or territory to provide uh, care in another state without going through the process of obtaining an in-state license. There were also some cases, uh, states in which uh, telehealth specific exemptions were implemented, which allowed out of state providers to deliver care in state via telehealth without an in-state license. Now, many of these flexibilities were tied to state declarations of, of emergency. And so now fast forward to uh, three or three and a half years later, uh, about to be fall of, of 2023, nearly all states have lifted the temporary flexibilities that were, were implemented during the height of the pandemic. There's only a small handful of states that still have flexibilities tied to their state declarations of emergency. But states are now in a position of trying to explore, you know, what policies that we implemented should we keep? Um, what should, you know, should we revert to the kind of pre, pre-COVID norm? And how do we make sense of, uh, you know, telehealth licensure and, and, and telehealth licensure and registration in, in the context of an evolving healthcare system. So, and there's been some guidance um, that, that's emerging from national organizations such as the AMA, um, FSMB, which we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about, and also the Uniform Laws Commission related to potential models for cross-state licensure, state-by-state -state licensure, and also uh, the provision of telehealth across state lines. Go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to provide a, a high-level overview of four different models that are emerging related to licensure for cross-state practice and telehealth services. And then Kim's going to go and provide state-by-state -state examples for each of these. And then I'm sure in the Q&A, uh, we're going to get into uh, e an even more granular level of detail on, in terms of what many of these model look, models look like in practice. So the first of these models is uh, interstate compacts. And as Dr. Ehrenfeld noted, uh, you know, we're going to discuss today the IMLC, uh, which is the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. 
Um, there, I will note that there are other compacts for other licensed health professionals, nurses, psychologists, audiologists, speech language pathologists, and others. Um, and the IMLC in particular creates an expedited licensure pathway for physicians to deliver either in-person or telehealth services in more than one state. Um, more than half of, of states are, are signatories to the IMLC at this point, I think more than 35 states. And, um, and that, that's one the, the first pathway that uh, is emerging. The second is licensure by endorsement or reciprocity. This provides an expedited pathway for physicians to obtain a full license in one state based on a set of qualifying criteria in that state um, and offers an expedited pathway to full licensure. The third pathway here, special purpose telehealth registries or licenses, these are in addition to uh, or in lieu of a full license. These are special licenses or registrations that enable a physician or other licensed professional, depends on the state, uh, who's, who's fully licensed in one state to obtain a special license to deliver telehealth services to in-state residents, often with some restrictions in place. Uh, these licenses or registrations are often less expensive or faster to obtain. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the theory behind the emergence of these types of models and a handful of, of states offer these uh, licenses or registrations and, and Kim will provide some examples in a moment. And then finally, exceptions to in-state licensure requirements. So within the context uh, of, of, a full, of a full license, there are certain states that are allowing physicians who are licensed in one state to deliver services via telehealth and in more limited cases in person to patients in that state without uh, being licensed in that state under certain circumstances, such as in a case of emergency or follow-up care. Um, and again, there are, there are a range of different um, exceptions that are being explored and implemented in different states, and, and, and we'll discuss some of those as well. So that hopefully gives a kind of lay of the land in terms of history and what some of the emerging models are. I'm going to hand it over to, to, to Kim, who's going to uh, go one level deeper on each of these four models and provide some more specific examples. Kim. Thanks, Jared. Great. Thanks so much, Jared. Um, great overview. Uh, next slide, please. As Jared said, I'm just going to dive in a little bit more. I'm not going to talk too much. I'm not going to talk about the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact because we have Marshall here who's going to provide a lot more information there. But um, so I'm going to start with licensure by endorsement. Um, it, this is not a new approach. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. And it's not limited to cross-state licensure for telehealth, um, but it can be used for that purpose. And and in fact, there are lots of states that have had licensure by endorsement in place even before the public health emergency. Basically, these models offer, as, as Jared said, a streamlined process for physicians licensed in another state to obtain licensure in a state if they meet certain requirements. And Virginia is a good example of a state that has a licensure by endorsement process. Physicians who meet certain requirements as laid out here can apply um, for licensure in uh, Virginia based on their existing state license in another state. And before I move forward, let me just make an important point. And that is that states are not limited to one of these models that we're talking about here. And in fact, states like Virginia have several of these models in place. Many states are members of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, but also may have some exceptions to licensure. They may have a reciprocity agreement. So again, you're not limited and states are not limited to one of these models. Um, now, picking back up the models. So licensure by reciprocity is another thing that I think that we're actually going to see more and more of, um, especially as states really start to dive into and really get a handle on who their patients are seeing. Um, are they seeing physicians? And I think what we're seeing is that they're actually, when they're receiving telehealth services, it's often from a physician just across the border of their state. So I think we're going to see a lot more reciprocity with um, with with states that um, that are that 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 share borders, um, like we have for Virginia, Maryland, and DC. Um, I imagine that we'll start to be seeing that. But basically, this approach it doesn't necessarily allow a physician to automatically receive a license um, in that state. So the process, for example, that Virginia, DC, and Maryland came up with is that it is a very much more expedited, streamlined process for a physician who is licensed in one of these jurisdiction, just jurisdictions to be licensed in one of the other jurisdictions. Um, it is aimed at minimizing the administrative burden 
for both the physician, but also, frankly, the state medical board. Um, and then working together, the three of these states can 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 um, can do that. And I, like I said, I imagine we'll see this in some other states. Um, Jared mentioned the special purpose telehealth registry or license. There are about a half a dozen states that currently have a special telehealth registry um, or license in their state. Florida being one of the first states to enact this type of model and actually did so before COVID. Um, while requirements will vary by state, of course, um, typically they have some of the same requirements that Florida does. And that is um, the physician who is looking to have a special telehealth license in Florida, um, it is limited to telehealth. That physician cannot have an in-state physical address. They cannot provide in-state services. They must also have a registered agent in the state and also need to have needs to have liability coverage for telehealth services provided in the state. Um, again, I think that we'll continue to see states adopt this type of model. As Jared mentioned, the Uniform Laws Commission has a model registry process as well. And finally, many states have an exception to lic licensure specifically for providing telehealth in certain circumstances. Um, here's a summary of some of the exceptions found in Arizona, um, but many other states have these in place as well. And again, even before the pandemic, states have had in place exceptions to licensure in response to an emergency, or if a physician is consulting with a physician in another state who has an existing patient-physician relationship with the patient whom the physician is consulting on. Um, so in those instances, physicians don't need to have a license to practice in those states. But I think we're starting to see um, an uptick in interest in states looking at some other very narrow exceptions to licensure. And this is actually something that the AMA supports um, when we're talking about continuity of care. Um, so for example, where a physician um, is providing ongoing or follow-up care to a patient that happens to be in another state temporarily or for a limited period of time. We're talking about college students. We're talking about snowbirds um, who may be, you know, elderly who maybe live in Arizona or Florida for part of the year. Um, but those are the kind of the, the types of populations that this can really have a positive impact on. And again, in those instances where that physician is providing follow-up care or ongoing care for that patient, they would not need to be licensed in the state um, via this exception. Um, about a half a dozen states have this exception in place right now. And again, I think it is something that we will continue to see. It's something that the AMA supports, and it's something that we actually have model legislation on as well. Um, next slide, please. And it's a good segue to the AMA perspective here. And we have lots of policy on telehealth. Um, this policy and what you see here is really limited to our policy focused on licensure. Um, important, important to just kind of note at the outset that we continue to support a state-based licensure system, policies that physicians and other healthcare professionals must be licensed in the state where the patient is receiving care um, when they are receiving the services, right? Um, and that is um, also because we believe that physicians and other healthcare professionals have to abide by state licensure laws but also the Medical Practice Act and all other laws in the state where the patient is located. The AMA has long supported the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. As I mentioned, we support exceptions, some of those limited exceptions that I mentioned earlier. And of course, we encourage states to facilitate telehealth for continuity of care to preserve that critical patient-physician relationship that I mentioned. Um, and again, just a common sense exception. Um, again, we have that in our model bill as well. Um, there is an issue brief that we have that is available on our website. I can go ahead and put a, a link in the chat here um, that so you can have access to it that outlines a lot of what Jared and I just talked about. So if you want to have something um, to look at after the after the webinar. And with that, uh, Dr. Ehrenfeld, I will pass it back to you to get started with the panel. Awesome. Jared, Kim, thank you so much for uh, setting the stage for us. So let me go through some questions that I've got for our, our panel. And we're already starting to see some questions roll in. We've got a bunch of questions through registration. So uh, we'll get to as many as we can uh, before the hour is up. So let me start with um, Dr. Turkanda. Part of the rationale for state-based licensure is to ensure patient protections. That is, a patient has a clear pathway and a mechanism to report an issue to the state medical board for consideration and action. What role do you see the state medical boards playing in the regulation of cross-state telehealth practice? And how can state medical boards ensure patient safety and provider accountability? 
So thank you, Dr. Ehrenfeld, and uh, thank you to the AMA for allowing me to participate. Um, you know, state medical boards have uh, really the statutory duty to protect the public. But uh, given the changes in the regulatory challenges and patient safety concerns, we're having to adapt the in-person provision of medical care to this newer model of telehealth care. Um, this, the one thing that's important is that the standard of care does not change with the modality and should remain reasonably consistent across states. We realize that the standard of care um, can be regional. Uh, regional. In the regulation of cross-state telehealth practice, state medical boards should provide some guidance and achieve some reasonable consensus on some of the broader issues, such as, number one, harmonizing regulations to facilitate telehealth across state lines while maintaining patient safety. We should also uh, establish clear guidelines and requirements for healthcare providers who wish to practice, pra practice telehealth across state lines. This includes uh, ensuring that providers are appropriately licensed and credentialed to practice in the state where the patient's located and verify the qualifications and the credentials of those providers. In addition, state medical boards should ensure that providers offering telehealth services are aware, and, uh, aware of and compliant with state-specific laws and regulations governing telehealth practice. Um, state medical boards also have the responsibility of establishing clear and accessible mechanisms for patients to file complaints regarding telehealth services. And this is all part of making that cross-state licensure efficient. Um, when a complaint is re uh, received, state medical boards should have the authority and resources to investigate the matter thoroughly, even if it's across state lines. Uh, this may involve reviewing medical records, conducting interviews, and collaborating with other state agencies. Um, I think importantly in the long term, state medical boards have the responsibility of monitoring and evalu evaluating cross-state practices. Um, there should be periodic assessments of the telehealth practices and regulations so that we can adapt to the evolving healthcare landscape. Um, you know, as uh, Kim and uh, Jared mentioned, there are a variety of approaches to facilitate interstate, interstate license portability. Um, I think, uh, Kim, you had mentioned that the, the the INLC and permanent licenses. There are currently 23 states and the District of Columbia that have permanent interstate telemedicine mechanisms in place, in addition to the IMLC. Nine states plus the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands use telemedicine or special licenses. Uh, uh, nine states also use registration or waiver systems. Um, three states in uh, District of Columbia use a regional reciprocity approach or a memorandum of understanding. Utah, in fact, allows a pro bono interstate telemedicine license, uh, and there are two or, uh, two states that allow for consultative services only. Um, regarding, you know, ensuring patient safety and provider accountability, um, you know, the relationship between the physician and the patients is based on a mutual understanding of shared responsibility. You know, defining when uh, when the relationship begins can be sometimes difficult, but the relationship is, is clearly established when the physician agrees to undertake the diagnosis and treatment of the patient and the patient agrees to be treated. Um, to protect patients, we have to ensure that the practitioner uses telemedicine to meet the same standard of care and professional ethics as a practitioner using traditional in-person encounters. From a board perspective, you know, we see the failure to follow standard of care or professional ethics um, that may subject the practitioner to a discipline uh, by a medical board. Um, I think one of the things to ensure a patient is to have the appropriate patient informed consent uh, for the use of telehealth. Um, appropriate consent should at a baseline include simplistically the identification of the patient, patient location, identification of the physician, their own credentials, and the physician's state of practice. We also need to have an identification of the patient's primary care physician for continuity of care. Um, I think those are just the sim simple things from an informed consent uh, uh, practice. We also have to have patient uh, ensure patient privacy and make sure that that patient is being seen for uh, for uh, an established care. So I'll I'll stop at that point, uh, Jesse. Very very helpful to hear the perspective from FSMB, um, Marshall. Can you tell us about the current state of the IMLC? How's it being utilized? What kind of data 
do you have around the number of physicians that are participating? And what's the pathway to get 50 state participation? Yeah, uh, so the the compact, thank you. Um, uh, let me start out by saying thank you. I appreciate the invitation sure. to participate in this uh, panel and discussion. So as of um, the, the end of our fiscal year, which ended on um, June 30th, we have um, over 16,000 physicians that have utilized the compact and the compact process. Those 16,000 physicians have completed and received 48,000 letters of qualification. And as a result of those letters of qualification, over 75,000 licenses have been issued to physicians to practice medicine in the United States. We just published, we just completed a, an extensive, um, and thank you to the FSMB for, for helping us with this. We just completed a study of looking at the new licenses issued in the United States in the calendar year 2022. And what we found was that 17% of all new licenses issued to physicians in 2022 came through the compact process. That's that's include that includes states that are part of the compact and not part of the compact. 17% or almost a fifth of all the licenses issued in the United States in 2022 to physicians came through the compact process. The and, and looking just at our member board, so the states that are participating in the compact, there are 39 states, the territory of Guam and the District of Columbia, 31% of those on average, 31% of all the new licenses issued in those states came from the compact. So with regards to that, the compact, um, and, and I would like to state you know, on the record and, and, and publicly that, that the compact really is agnostic with regards to all of these, these different approaches to, to getting physicians so that they can practice in their state. It is really, um, I, I think there's this, there's a misnomer that there's in a sense a competition between should we do this or should we do this? And really, I think the smartest approach that I have, I, that I've seen, and, and, and it certainly is one that the compact endorses, is why shouldn't states create opportunities or, in a sense, a, a, a tool belt for the physician to make the decision on how they can best provide the care um, to their patient, whether that's obtaining a full and unrestricted license through the compact process, the traditional process, doing reciprocity, and all of those sorts of things. So not wanting to get into that debate, but I think that's um, certainly a part of that. And then before I get to how we're going to get to all 50 states, which is which is what we will do, um, I've, I've made that um, my um, enduring vow, and um, it, it'll, it'll it'll be in, it marked on my tombstone. Um, so uh, we, we keep hearing there are two main pain points for physicians with regards to um, the, the compact process and obtaining state-based licensure and, and that. The first is regarding the cost or the fees that are associated with that. And, and um, the compact really has no influence or ability to influence our member boards and the fees that they charge. However, I would note that, that most states look at the fees that they charge on an annual basis. And we've had five states that have reduced the cost of all licenses or uh, physician licenses for all physicians, not just compact licenses. And I think the compacts and the the, in, the input that we have had in providing those additional licenses for those states have had, have had an impact on that. Um, so I think that was one of the things that will continue to happen. The compact itself, we look at our fees every year. We have a model that we look at our revenues. We're trying to anticipate that going out um, into the future and, and making sure that what we charge is appropriate. Um, I am aware that there is a study being done and, and hopefully will be published in October so we can actually talk about it. But uh, this study, it's a, uni a university has been studying the compact since 2017. And what they found is that, that states that have introduced the compact have reduced the overall, not just not just the licensing fee aspect and, and the preparations aspect, but all aspects of a physician preparing to be able to have a practice in multiple states. Um, meaning that that um, sometimes there is a variable amount of, 
of knowing when you're going to get that license in that state and being able to establish your practice and, and open an office and hire staff and all that stuff. The compact provides a stability to that. It, there, there is a there is a very strong evidence with regards to how quickly physicians can get that license. And that average for us is about seven to 10 days. So it, it is it is a known factor and, and all that will be coming out. The second pain point is with regards to keeping track of all these darn licenses that I've now got. And the compact is, is making a major investment. We just have uh, um, engaged uh, a, a, a vendor, a Mockingbird, uh, to create what we're calling an enhanced physician portal. That enhanced physician portal the goal behind it, um, the and, and we're intending for it um, to be rolled out about a year from now, will be in a sense a physician, an electronic physician wallet. The physician in one place will be able to track all of their licenses that they currently have, that they've ever held. And those licenses that they're currently using will, will be able to tra um, record and um, keep track of all the continuing education requirements, all the requirements for all of the different states, and it'll be in one place and it'll be electronic and be available for those physicians. So we're doing that. Now to the tricky question of getting all 50 states. Um, part of what we're finding, especially now that, that we're down to the last 11 states, is really there isn't much and, and this is an overly broad statement, but there really is not much opposition to the compact um, and, and to joining the state. It's really more of an apathy. Um, someone has to, the compact, the way that it's designed, we can't advocate um, for the, the, the introduction of the bill. We can provide information and education and support the bill once it's introduced, but it's finding that advocate, especially in those larger states like California and Florida, um, and getting getting that that advocacy moving forward. Once it starts, um, it's generally found there there really is no downside to patients by having the compact in in a state, and that that really the fears that have prevented some states from joining the compact that it's going to take away physician jobs, it's going to um, have a negative impact on the hospitals and their ability to. Um, uh, have local talent that is not really going to reach out to um, rural and underserved areas. All of those really are being found to be false. We've been in business and operating for six years, and and the data is supporting those claims that those 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 concerns and fears are not um, based in fact. And so. One of the things that we're doing is we're working on our advocacy We're we're doing these these. Um, studies, looking at the data, getting hard information so legislators can make their decision about that. We're surveying physicians to find out um, if the compact is meeting their needs and if we're doing things appropriately. And I think the answer starts to become, it really does make sense for a state to join the compact. It's one more tool for them to use or for physicians to be able to use to be able to practice in their state and address those issues. We're also, one of the things that, I, and I've seen an advanced copy of this study, and I'll close with this comment, but one of the things that that study has found is that, um, or is, 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 and they actually have the data to, to support it, is that the single most important activity a state can take to increase the number of licensed physicians in their state is to join the compact. It's twice as effective as all of the other methodologies where you're forgiving um, student debt, where you're um, creating reciprocity, where you're creating special licenses or special processes. Joining the compact is two times more effective than all of those other things. And so, I, again, I, I don't think it makes sense for a state not to join the compact and do these other things, too, if they believe that's important. And we support that activity. So with that, I will... Um, be quiet and, and thank you again for this opportunity to participate. Fantastic. Marshall, thank you so much. And thank you for previewing that study. We'll look forward to that coming out soon, hopefully. Um, let me turn to Clark. So Clark, the national capital region has been at the vanguard of thinking around licensure policy. Can you kind of walk us through how Virginia developed reciprocity to licensure with DC and Maryland? And, and why is that important to physicians? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, here in Virginia, we are obviously blessed 
um, with uh, close proximity to, to several advanced states in the world of healthcare. So several years ago in 2018, Senator Barbara Favola um, of Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia obviously um, being usually at the forefront of these conversations, having a lot of people go in and out of both DC and Maryland due to uh, employment with the federal government, asked the Board of Medicine here in the Commonwealth to look at reciprocity. Um, and that was just what we call a section one bill, but but it just said Board of Medicine, go figure this out, was essentially what the bill said. You don't need to go to law school to write that one. Um, and of course, when it comes to reciprocity, it takes two to tango. Um, so you can't just establish reciprocity. You know, um, my wife had to say yes to marrying me. A state has to say yes to doing licensure reciprocity. Um, and so uh, they reached out to all of the available states uh, that applied. Um, so North Carolina, Tennessee, D.C. or Maryland. Um, in Tennessee and North Carolina said, no, thank you. Um, uh, D.C. and Maryland said, well, let's wait and see. Um, so the conversation kept going and going and going. And then as many things in the world of telehealth post COVID, um, the, the floodgates really opened up DC and Maryland's um, either through a leadership change or, or just advocacy um, therein said, Hey, let's do it. Um, and then consequently over the past year um, uh, really two years ago, I suppose they, they hashed out all the legal arrangements and then that went live um, uh, in the winter, uh, the late winter of 2023. So uh, currently, if you are a, a licensed physician in Virginia, Maryland, or DC, um, we now have licensure reciprocity, meaning um, with uh, hopefully just a few clicks of the button at your uh, associated board of medicine state site, um, you can get a license in as little as 48 hours. Um, so we're still hoping for Tennessee and North Carolina to come on board. Um, I ask our, our chairman of our board of medicine, have you heard from them in a while? Uh, and then he tells me uh, uh, some unkind words, but um, we're still trying to do that because we still have uh, individuals in those regions uh, where I think it would make a lot of sense to have that arrangement. Um, but it, it's been a boon to uh, members of the Commonwealth and, and physicians therein. Um, and as a former resident of Alexandria, Virginia, who lived in DC and dated a girl in Maryland, I can tell you that reciprocity is much needed. Very, very helpful. Let me throw out two questions for anybody on the panel and folks, uh, feel free to just jump in. Um, biggest opportunity for the industry and states when it comes to developing telehealth licensure regulations and the biggest risks, what do people think? Well, Jesse, I, I, I can just start off just in, the, in a general way from a board perspective. Well, you know, we're going to expand access to healthcare. I mean, that's one of the biggest reasons to, uh, to bring telehealth uh, to the forefront. Uh, it reduces those geographic barriers, allows for improved and specialized care, hopefully, and access to that, and improves uh, continuity of care. I don't know if we can actually say we have reduced wait times because we still don't know if access has really improved incredibly uh, through telehealth. Hopefully, we can uh, uh, improve on chronic disease management and mental health services, which has been at the forefront of telehealth uh, from the beginning. Uh, you can see that mental health services have increased uh, uh, dramatically over the past few years. So I'll let others speak to the to some of the opportunities for uh, improving telehealth licensure uh, portability. Jump in. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I I would say I think one of the biggest um, potential um, issues or hurdles with regards to telemedicine and its adaptation and and providing medical services is that it um, there's a danger or a fear or there, I think there's a danger with regards to the idea that it's different or it's a special kind of medicine and in reality it is not it is a, it's a modality by which physicians can provide treatment to patients and I think this, uh, I think the more we bring it back into that concept that you have to have a license to practice medicine. And as a professional, the physician is responsible for figuring out the best way to treat that patient. It may be telemedicine, it may be in, in, in patient, but getting, getting away from treating telemedicine as something special or something unique, um, while it is, and I understand where we've gotten to, but I, I think if we if we continue to take that too far, I think there's a there. I would have a fear that that um, we start creating special licenses for it, and then it becomes a different type of medicine. And then I, I would just add, um, as a lobbyist, I think about threats all the time. Uh, it's a very healthy way to live. Um, I, I would just say, 
Um, the threat is the opportunity for money when it comes to telehealth and licensure. Um, uh, here in Virginia, we're seeing a lot of corporate interests start to staff up and lobby up when it comes to the world of telehealth. And there is a scenario that I don't think is too too crazy to think that those interests want to basically churn and burn telehealth services yeah. um, without state licensure. So um, they want to pick whatever state is the cheapest state to do business in warehouse a bunch of kiosks with a fast internet connection, hire some mid-level providers, and then uh, churn and burn uh, telehealth visits. Um, you only need to Google uh, the company Cerebral, which made the New York Times about a year ago, I think, um, which is in the telepsych space. But but that is the worst case scenario um, uh, of what we have, which is why, um, at least here in Virginia, you know the, the state level boards and that protection, that patient protection that you talked about is kind of our our line in the sand on any telehealth piece of legislation and probably going forward always will be. Very helpful. So, um, Sarvam Kark, what are you hearing from physicians, people who, you know, practice telehealth in addition to an in-person practice, telehealth only people, um, you know, what are your experiences with the licensure flexibilities that we had during the public health emergency that people really want to see carried forward? So, you know, Feedback from some of those physicians um, early on was uh, a challenge. There were there were those that adopted telehealth fairly readily and quickly, and then those who were a little bit more traditional wanted to see their patients, so they had a little slow adoption. But those who embrace telehealth uh, actually have a very high both patient and provider satisfaction, physician satisfaction, uh, upwards over 90%. Um, so th- those... As Clark's, or I think Marshall, you know, the standard of care is the standard of care, whether depending on, de- not dependent on the modality. And so those who embrace that thought process as they move forward, ensuring that when the patient was seen, that the standard of care was met for that patient, did very, very well with, with embracing telehealth. I think some of the flexibilities that patient or the providers miss from the PHE or the, uh, the emergency is, you know, the, the waiver of the state license requirements. Um, you know, we we had, uh, we didn't have to worry about having licenses and, and uh, you know, having state boards maybe look at your uh, ability to practice in that area. We also didn't have uh, the issues surrounding reimbursement. Um, I mean, we saw uh, Medicare, Medicaid and, and, you know, relax on their requirements uh, for where telehealth could be practiced, and also endorse the uh, endorse the uh, payment methods for that. So I I think that's where we see the flexibilities. Uh, if we can't improve on payment models for telehealth, I don't think we'll grow it any further. Thanks, Clark. In the near in the Commonwealth, uh, we're really having conversations about how all in to go with telehealth is what I'm hearing. Obviously, we had the expansion. Um, COVID and post COVID. And then the question is, should I keep doing tele, you know, this much telehealth versus this much in person? Should I go all in? Um, And and I think what you're seeing is an ongoing conversation. And I know the leadership at the AMA is talking about this, but um, what do patients want out of their providers? What do they expect? Um, I have two small children and I'll tell you pretty much every pediatrician I've ever come into contact with just gives out their cell phone number now and says, "Eh, text me when you need me, you know, when things come up. And that's almost going to be the expectation, I think. But that is a, a immense burden on the physicians and provider community um, to basically be available at all hours of the day. So if that's something that, that we're gearing towards and patients have come to expect, um, is that something that's sustainable? And then what protections, both um, financially, personally, can we build in to, to make that happen? Thanks. So let me ask one more question for uh, Marshall, and then we'll get to the audience Q&A. Um, any future where there emerges a national compact structure that offers reciprocity as some newer licensed healthcare professional compacts offer? That I, I would say, I think that is probably more of a good think tank topic. Um, yes, I, I, I think looking at how do we, because the compact itself and the way that it's established has a high bar, bright light standard that if a physician meets this, they can participate. And if they don't, they can't. And I think 
it does miss out on those physicians who are just graduating and who have an opportunity. And I, I think that really, to me, is kind of the next opportunity, um, the next kind of compact. How do we, how do we compact 2.0 or something like that of, of, of where, you know, now that we know this process works and it, it's there, um, how do we start um, expanding it out um, and, and make that available to more? Did I, did I get to the question? I, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Thanks for that, Marshall. Um, so let me turn to, to our audience. So we're going to go through some questions that were submitted uh, online now in the chat, as well as in advance. Um, thanks for those that are rolling in. We've got a ton of questions. I know we're going to have time because we've only got about 15 minutes left. Um, so let me uh, throw one out to everybody. Any interest uh, in solving this on a national or regional approach, or is it just going to be state by state? Is there any reason there can't be a United States medical license? Congress. Same. Okay. same. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think I think the uh, legislative possibilities of, of such a thing would be very very difficult. But that's all. And I think also. Um, for all of its controversy, the Dobbs decision really did reinforce the idea that the practice of medicine is a state-based activity. And so now we've got a Supreme Court decision that supports that concept. Um, and I think it would be difficult to overcome that sort of a legal challenge to create a national license. But but again, and that, those are my opinions, not, not the opinions of the compact. But I, I think that's where we're... I, I, Coming up with a national license, I think, is a dead topic in today's and environment. Jesse, if I may add that, yeah. you know, Mar building on Marshall's thought processes, as as these licenses are state based, you know, you have to realize the medical practice acts are state based, and to try to align fifty states and their medical practice acts would be exceptionally difficult. So I think that that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest hurdles in all this. Let me uh, let me stick with Marshall. So current certification by ABMS or AOA BOS board is required for participation in the compact um, because of some of the changes happening, uh, requirements for yearly fees, MOC, um, many excellent physicians are letting their board certifications lapse. Are they still allowed to participate in the compact based on their initial certification? Yeah, the board certification requirement is for the initial letter of qualification. And once the physician has their initial letter of qualification, they can come back and get more. The board certification requirement drops off. And that was in recognition of maintenance of certification and all of those sorts of issues and concerns that were raised. And so it's required as an initial, but after that, it's not required for the physician. So they can get their letter of qualification and drop their, their certification the next day, and they can continue to use the compact. Very helpful. Uh, this next one I think is for probably Sarvam. So are physicians allowed to have a telehealth visit with an out-of-state new patient? So, you, you know, traditionally we say that telehealth should be for established patients. And that's where that's where we, uh, we believe uh, is, is best approached for, for a new uh, for a new patient, that patient uh, needs to be seen by a physician that has a license in that state. If the, if they're going to move forward with a new telehealth, you know you can see a new patient, but you have to meet the standard of care. If you can't, if you need to have a a, a physical examination to make a diagnosis, obviously telehealth uh, uh, prevents that. So you haven't met the standard of care for that patient. So remember, no matter if it's a new patient or established patient, standard of care is the standard of care, and that must be met uh, uh, in evaluating those patients. Very helpful. Kim, do you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add, I think Dr. Takanda answered it perfectly. I think the one thing I would add is just that exception um, for consultations, right, where if a physician has a established relationship with the patient is consulting, right, with another physician who might be out of state that would be an area where they wouldn't necessarily need a license in that state, but that's a very kind of narrow consultation exception. Yeah, and building on that, Kim, is, you know, those exceptions for licensure, you know, physician to physician consultations, uh, prospective patient screening for complex referrals to um, centers of excellence, um, you know, episodic and follow-up care for established patients should, is the norm. And any type of follow-up travel, uh, surgical or medical, 
and clinical trials. We think in those situations, that's an exception to for licensure, and you don't necessarily have to have a license in that state where the patient's located. Got it. Very helpful. So there's a question regarding shield laws and state licensure compacts and how they interact. Anybody want to tackle that one? I will boldly go where most fear to tread. <laughs> um, that, this is this is one of the most common uh, concerns being raised, and we, we've had conversations and talked to um, provided testimony to uh, Rick Masters and I have provided testimony to state legislators, uh, legislatures about the shield laws, but also on the other side, um, there are concerns about um, those shield laws being overreaching and allowing physicians to go where um, to use that protection to provide services that are not in accordance with the practice act of the state. The compact has been very, very um consistent and insistent on the idea that we are founded. Section one of the compact statute is each state has the complete and full right to regulate practice of medicine in their state. And they regulate that practice through the issuance of a license. That, that authority and that right of that state ends at their state border. Um, and we, we continue to believe that is true. We believe that that's the best sort of federalism. We believe that's the intention of, of state-based healthcare regulation. Um, and and uh, we continue to support that. And we continue to strongly say the compact supports shield laws. Being, being a member state of the compact provides additional statutory authority to protect those shield laws because of how the compact language is, is established and, and works. It also works for those states that have chosen to restrict um, the, the health care options for, for physicians to provide to, to women. And um, we are not wading into the politics of it. We're not wading into the to the right or wrongness of any of those decisions, but we are wading into the fact that it is each state's right to do that. And the compact supports that and supports those laws and, and, and supports shield laws. And it also supports those states that choose to um, have those restrictions in place. Marshall, how has the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact helped physicians? You know, I think the biggest thing that we have done uh, as is made it easier for the physicians to practice um, and and to expand their practice and ability to um, control those costs. Um, we know that on average it costs three hundred and eighty five dollars to apply for a single state license using the traditional method. Seven hundred dollars is what the compact charges, and and so if a physician applying to two or more states, um, it, it's it's more economical to use us. It's it's one place. It's one stop. It's one website. It's it's yeah. it's something we strive for. So I think I think if it, it, it's something I'm very proud of, and my staff and the board staff, um, we we have allowed boards to focus on. We we handle the squeaky clean applications. The board staff gets to focus on those that require their expertise and knowledge to make sure that the license being issued is to a physician who is safe. Um, th thanks for that. A uh, lot of questions coming online. One was uh, from Daniel. Are there any states that require telehealth providers be physically in the same state as the patient at the time of the service, assuming that provider is licensed in the state where the patient resides at the time of the visit? Thought maybe New Mexico had such a restriction? Uh, the other follow-up question is, what happens if the physician is abroad? So. Jesse, there are some international laws that would prevent you providing some telehealth services uh, if the physician is abroad. Uh, I think they have to look into those international uh, uh, regulations there. You know, on the other hand, providing telehealth to uh, international patients has also presents some issues. And uh, one that I, I, I repeatedly hear is about China. If you're providing telehealth service to a patient in China, even if it's a U.S. citizen, that medical record has to exist in China and not in, in, in the United States. So I think going internationally, you have to be very, very careful, make sure you meet all the regulatory uh, issues that may arise there. Um, I, I mean, I think if you're practicing in a state, you have a, a state license uh, in that state and you're 
and you're providing telehealth services. I don't, I, I don't think there's any state board that would um, say you couldn't do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with what's happening in New Mexico, but I'd be interested to know. Maybe Jared wants to weigh in. Yeah, not, not on New Mexico specifically, but just to add one more layer to this. Um, some states, th this is not related to the ability to practice in the state, but from a payment perspective, some payers, commercial payers or Medicaid programs in particular will often require either a physical address in order to enroll in the Medicaid program or with a commercial payer. Um, and so it, it could also be that what is being seen is more of a payment level issue than the actual ability to provide the service. Let me ask one last question and then I'm just gonna make a closing comment or two. Uh, and the question is, should pathologists who read the last slides from patients out of state have a medical license in the state in which the patient resides? And I imagine you could extend that maybe to a radiologist who's reading a film from a patient in a different state. So that's an interesting question, uh, Jesse and I, and I, I think if you're uh, a practicing physician, you need to have a license where the patient's physically located. To have carve-outs for specialties, I think it makes it much more difficult. And Any Virginia, the answer is yes. Sounds like there's consensus for yes. Well, awesome. So um, thank you to everybody uh, who logged on. We had several hundred attendees today. Obviously, this has been recorded, so we'll post it online along with all of the materials, uh, the slides that were shared. Um, really appreciate everybody on the panel uh, for walking us through some solutions. Um, we've heard a lot today from our experts and through the questions learned a ton about how we collectively can support telehealth, not just for physicians who provide the virtual care, but at the end of the day, it's all about our patients, our patients who are relying on this modality. Um, thank you all so much for your time today, and I hope you can join us for our next AMA Advocacy Insights webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you.